Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, Bob, and Marty for those comments, and, and good morning. Uh, so this is actually my third year as the chair of the Cancer Gold Standard. And in that capacity, I am often reminded of the extraordinary opportunity we have, but, but also the immense responsibility that we have as we go about our work as a task force. And uh, never more so am I reminded of those feelings than when I come here to this annual meeting. And it really is a highlight. It really is a highlight for the reasons we've heard so eloquently from Chris and Marty and, and Bob this morning. For me, it's really the, the energy and the enthusiasm that comes by being part of a, a, a group of people who come together with a common cause and a common commitment. And that, so for me, I always come away from these meetings with a renewed sense of energy to really redouble our efforts and stretch ourselves further. So um, I'm really excited to be here today and to share with you our progress. Now, before I start, Chris, I do have to thank you for the papal humor and the comment on the uh, sweet Sistine. When you're in the O'Hagan family, it's really handy to have an Irish Catholic joke at all times. <laughs> And trust me, I will be using that this weekend, so, so thank you for that. Okay, so we have about an hour together this morning, and just to give you a sense of what we're going to cover, first of all, we're going to take a look back. I want to share with you some of our uh, proud accomplishments from 2012, uh, but equally importantly, share with you a glimpse of what's on the horizon. We have some very exciting things that the task force is working on, both domestically and uh, what we fondly call going global. And so we're going to take some time to talk about some very real progress in that particular arena. Uh, like last year, we're going to use some of our time in a panel discussion. I think last year we found that was a very engaging and interactive way to really think about, not through PowerPoint, but through real dialogue, what is the role of the gold standard? And the theme that we're going to pick on, to, uh, selected this year, is, is looking really at the gold standard as a platform, if you will, for enhancing health and wellness in our communities. And we're really excited and delighted to have some distinguished guests to help us with that panel. So that's what we're going to do over the next hour. And we really do hope there's some time for engagement and questions. So uh, we'll start with the numbers. I know I'm with a bunch of CEOs and business leaders. So we start with numbers. And uh, very exciting progress. We like the way that this graph continues to go up. What you see here is we are now at 140 member companies. And we are touching about 3.5 million lives. So we are really excited about that. Uh, and we are very confident these numbers will only increase. Right now, Peggy tells us when we go back to work on Monday, we have three new applications that we will be reviewing. And we also have uh, seven or eight very large employers, very large employers, who have expressed interest in the gold standard. Uh, so we are very confident that these numbers will continue to grow. And I personally feel nervous, like every year when I come here, like it has to be going up, right? I know Bill Weldon said 5 million, so I don't think they're going to let me retire from the task force until we hit 5 million. So, so th the numbers are important, but I, I really think it's important to not just focus on the numbers. And let's not confuse the ends and the means, if you will. Because the goal is not to get companies on board. And the goal is not to cover lies, but the goal is to have impact and to really be a contributor in, in terms of cancer prevention, access to treatment, uh, quality, quality access to medicines, and, and survivorship. So we um, really are very uh, um, clear in our commitment to evolve the gold standard and make sure that we are increasingly impactful in the work that we do. So this slide shares with you a couple of things that we think really uh, depict our evolution. And the first is ensuring that the gold standard remains scientifically sound and evidence-based. And a couple of things going on on this front in terms of evidence-based. And last year, we shared with you that we had made some revisions to the tobacco coverage standards. We feel that has been an extremely important development. Uh, we work closely with NCI, but also uh, with Dr. Richard Hurt from Mayo. And I know Dr. Hurt is not with us, but I think Bob Diasio from Mayo is with us. So we greatly appreciate that. We feel it was a really important enhancement to that particular pillar. Uh, two new groups that are actively engaged with us uh, in, our, in our quest to evolve the standard. The first is the Cancer Clinical Trials sub-team. And this group is really looking for ways to explore to better educate and remove barriers to participation in clinical trials. And, and really um, focusing on making headway and removing some of these um, obstacles in adult participation. The task force uh, last fall had a fantastic opportunity. We spent two days at NIH, thanks to Jane Jacobs. And we spent a lot of time at NCI. And in particular, we visited the pediatric oncology unit. And we think there's a lot to learn from the pediatric oncology community in terms of participation and enrollment. And so this group is hard at work. And we look forward to reporting back to you next year on our progress there. 
the second sub-team that's actively underway is our survivorship sub-team. And uh, this is where a team that's looking at exploring ways for employers to play a larger role in supporting cancer survivors and their families. And, you know, increasing um, numbers of cancer survivors is a welcome challenge. Uh, but it is a challenge nonetheless. And so this team is actively engaged in, in efforts along those lines. And once again, we're so fortunate to have in our, our network, uh, the gold standard community, so much talent and expertise. And in this regard, I'd like to especially uh, thank Kenya Johnson from Livestrong, who's really been uh, the catalyst in this regard. And she's keeping us really honest to this one. So we thank you for that. So those are a couple of things that are underway as it relates to scientific sound and evidence-based uh, standards. Uh, the next big thing is uh, taking the global gold standard global. And just a little teaser here, we're going to hold on this now because we're going to talk about it in more detail, Marty and I, at the end of, of our presentation. And the last thing that, that we are focusing on this year is really um, enhancing the concept of outreach in our communities. And you will recall that early on, a big piece of our strategy was CEO to CEO outreach. And that remains really, really critical. But we believe uh, we have tremendous opportunity in the area of outreach in our communities because we believe that one of the best ways to encourage adoption of the gold standard is for employers to reach out to others, not just in their industry, but in their communities. And so that we really um, chose as a theme. And Peggy tells me this slide is going to build. So I'm going to hope that it builds. Maybe I'll push it one more time. There we go. So if we look, for example, at our NCI designated centers, we think this is a fantastic case that shows the impact of outreach and the, the platform that the gold standard can provide. Uh, for example, we look at MD Anderson, first NCI designated center back in 2008. And today, as I stand here, we have 16 designated centers, including NCI, that are gold standard accredited. So we think this is a really fantastic platform, and that's why we chose this really as our theme for our panel discussion. There we go. And so we've chosen really as the theme of our, our, our panel discussion today is really the gold standard at work in our communities. Looking at how can the gold standard provide a framework to enhance health and wellness within the workplace community, but secondly, not just in the workplace community, but in the communities in which we live. And lastly, how can the gold standard offer the opportunity to address a common need for health improvement across all workplaces? And so that's going to be the basis of our panel discussion today. And with that, I'm going to ask Dr. Bernadette Melnick and Dr. Ernest Hawk to take the stage and start our discussion. Now, as Dr. Melnick and Dr. Hawk are making their way to the stage, I have to just make a little confession. When we were preparing for the meeting these past weeks and months, uh, talking about the panel and the, the very impressive biographies and backgrounds of our panelists. Uh, Peggy let me know that Bernadette likes to go by Bern. So that's great, I'll, I'll call her Bern. And then last week she said, you know, Ernest likes to go by Ernie. And so that's really great. And it took me about a second and a half to realize I'm going to be standing in front of a group of 65 really esteemed CEOs and professionals introducing Bern and Ernie. <laughs> and I was going to try to do it without thinking about Muppets and Big Birds and without giggling. So let's, let's just smile and welcome Bern and Ernie. <laughs> Now that we've got that done, I'll give a proper introduction. So you have in your packets the bios of our guests here today, but just a couple of things I'd like to, to, to talk about. First of all, starting with Byrne. So Byrne is um, the Ohio State University Dean of the College of Nursing and also holds the title of Chief Wellness Officer in the university. Uh, Dr. Melnick's role as Ohio State's Chief Wellness Officer is believed to be the first such position at a U.S. university. In her role, she is spearheading health promotion and wellness programs to enhance the highest level of health and to prevent physical and mental health disorders among faculty, staff, and students. Dr. Melnick is widely a recognized expert in evidence-based practice, intervention research, child and health, adolescent mental health. So welcome, Bernadette. Thank you. Dr. Hawk is Vice President and Division Head for Cancer Prevention and Population Sciences at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Prior to his appointment at MD Anderson, Dr. Hawk held several positions at the National Cancer Institute. He's earned numerous awards, including the NCI Research Award for Distinguished Achievement in Cancer Prevention, 
He's published more than 140 articles, abstracts, and book chapters. He's the Senior Deputy Editor for, Can Editor for Cancer Prevention Research, serves on the editorial board of Cancer Medicine, and an ad hoc reviewer for numerous peer-reviewed journals. So welcome, Dr. Hong. Thank you. So maybe, Ernie, kicking off the conversation, maybe we start with you, because as I mentioned, MD Anderson was actually the first NCI accredited institution in 2008. So maybe could you reflect a little bit and talk to us a bit about a little bit of that history and why that has been so important to the center, the gold standard? Sure. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me. and delighted to represent MD Anderson. Um, MD Anderson has been a comprehensive cancer center um, treating patients with cancer and known for its excellence for 70 years now. Um, but the focus of today's discussion is on prevention and wellness, and indeed it has a long and distinguished history there as well, dating back to the days of our second president, um, uh, Mickey Lemaitre, who established, for, based upon his own experience in prevention, established the Division of Cancer Prevention and Population Sciences, which subsequently flourished under Dr. Mendelssohn's leadership. The gold standard has made a very important contribution to MD Anderson by helping to raise the visibility of prevention and wellness across our campus, but also uh, establishing a culture, essentially, of health and wellness that, that pervades the, the environment. Fantastic. And I noted on the slide we have here, kind of, a, I think it's a great symbol of the pride that this institution has. You see the, the uh, CEO gold standard logo there on this. Is your, I believe your career website? Yes. Well done, well done. Excellent, thank you, thank you so much. So just maybe continuing on that thought, in a hospital environment, how important is employee well-being, you know, caring for the people who care for others? Could you comment a little bit on that? Sure, well, what, what we're showing in this slide is uh, the Duncan Family Institute, the Duncan Building now, um, that was a very large philanthropic gift, a $50 million gift to our institution um, that was intended specifically to advance prevention. Uh, and, of course, at MD Anderson, everything starts with research. That's the premise. And then we, we envision a tri-directional transformation or uh, translation out to the benefit of our patients in our clinics. Secondly, our, our uh, community through our cancer control efforts. And then thirdly, uh, through to the future in terms of our education. It's that second one uh, focused on the community, the internal community that I'll, that I'll explore now in greater depth. So um, we use the CEO gold standard to bolster activities in four or five different areas. First of all, um, we have uh, established a large tobacco treatment program that brings tobacco cessation services, psychotherapy, pharmacotherapy, as well as follow-up care to individuals. We've treated now some 4,000 individuals free of charge. We provide that to our patients, their family members, to try to assist them because many times it's the context that helps an individual stop smoking, as well as their own behavior, uh, as well as to our employees. And that was a very important addition. Secondly, we built a very large uh, physical fitness facility, some 20,000 square feet, offering five different uh, types of services from group activities to strength training, flexibility training, yoga, Pilates, um, a whole range of services that are used now by some 3,000 individuals from our workforce have signed up and become a member of that. Third, we use the CEO Gold Standard to help bolster our nutritional services. So we uh, built a new building in the recent past and have a very large uh, 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 dietary component there, a, a new cafe that offers 70% healthy food options. Uh, that was uh, asked for by both our patients as well as our faculty and staff. And so that's another way we try to promote wellness across our campus. Um, similarly, we have vending machines across the institution. We've taken the CEO gold standard and um, convinced our vendors to be able to offer healthy alternatives in addition to traditional sodas, uh, sugar-based sodas and such, with prices inversely related to the health of the product. So those are a few of the tangible ways that we've taken action in the early days of the CEO gold standard to try to create a, a more healthy enterprise. Um, more recently now, we've taken the opportunity for um, activities to uh, work their way through our benefits program where we've created an incentive program to try to help individuals stop smoking by raising premiums uh, on them. That's a very common practice, at least now in Texas. Companies are beginning to do that, and we're seeing that's causing a stimulus to get more enrollment into our uh, tobacco treatment program. And most recently, as a part of the... Uh, 
meaningful use of uh, EMR uh, records, we've uh, connected the front, pay, the front uh, door uh, process of patient entry uh, and connected them electronically uh, with referrals to the Tobacco Treatment Center. In doing so, we saw a 300% increase in referrals wow. to those services. So it's a variety of different ways we've tried to benefit both our employees as well as the patients we serve to overall create a culture of health. I mean, those are really terrific examples. I'm thinking we should share with Mayor Bloomberg from New York the, the uh, vending machine beverage <laughs> example. Maybe that might work a little I'm bit sure better. I'm sure he's probably so, there ahead of us. <laughs> so, so terrific examples about what you're doing with your employees and, and, and your patients. Maybe one last question before we turn it to Byrne. You know, certainly public education and outreach to the community is, is a big part of the remit of, of, of our NCI uh, centers. How has the global, uh, global gold standard been, excuse me, the gold standard been used as a tool to really help support outreach in the communities of MD Anderson? Sure. Well, when, um, when Ron came, one of the things that he was very interested in seeing us bolster was our activities and control. So this, again, um, speaks specifically to his uh, endorsement of the CEO gold standard. But beyond that now, we've taken the uh, gold standard through both the uh, sorts of friend uh, meetings that we heard about last evening, uh, as well as um, specific initiatives our cancer control program. So Ron reorganized our efforts in cancer control. We have, in this area, there's, you know, it's easy to create lists of hundreds of things you'd like to do to try to benefit your community as a cancer center. Um, Ron's taken uh, the initiative to initiate a uh, specific directed effort toward eight problems in our local community where we have a bigger challenge in either health-related behaviors or cancer problems compared to the state population or the national um, rates uh, and chosen to focus on those specifically. Um, the first two of those, uh, no surprise, it being Texas, tobacco control, and secondly, uh, proper nutrition, uh, obesity avoidance. Uh, and so we've used those as platforms to reach out to the community. We have some 75 organizations now involved in our cancer control efforts. This is one example of the Greater Houston Partnership where Marty, we were able to invite him to come and uh, give a presentation to the, uh, the health services subcommittee of that group um, to try to get the message out about the gold standard and the importance of health and wellness among employees as well as uh, in, in the case of health organizations in the Texas Medical Center, our patients. I mean, we're extremely excited and appreciative about the friend raiser model, and we believe firmly that that's one to really exploit and explore, and, and you've really taken a lead in that regard. So. Uh, very much appreciate that. So. The Houston Partnership indeed uh, represents some 150 uh, employers in the greater Houston area, and so it's a very natural and, uh, and, and hopefully successful target as a first let's step. Let's count those, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. So, Bern, maybe let's turn a little bit to, to your story. And, you know, looking at through your background and, and reading about so many of your uh, really extraordinary accomplishments. It was, it's kind of hard to think of where to start, but maybe um, certainly the Ohio State University has a, a unique approach to wellness. So maybe talk a little bit about what makes it unique. You bet. I'd first like to ask everybody, how many of you have tried to change the behavior of somebody you love? Well, that is squeeze the toothpaste differently, get more <laughs> physically active. We're always trying to get people to change behavior. But we all know what, what does usually trigger folks to make a behavior change. It isn't usually information and facts. It's usually crisis or it's emotion that people get motivated to begin to do something differently. So I was 15 years of age, and I grew up in a small little town in southwestern Pennsylvania. My dad was a coal miner. I was leading a pretty happy life until one day I was home alone with my mom. She sneezed, and she fell over. She burst a cerebral aneurysm and died right in front of me. Now, the sad thing about that particular story is she had been having headaches for over a year. And my father kept saying, would you go to the doctor and figure out what's wrong with you? Well, she finally went to our family physician a week before she died, got a prescription for an antihypertensive medication that she never filled. And my dad found it in her purse after she died. 
about eight years ago, I lost one of my dearest friends to ovarian cancer. And she too ignored her symptoms for about a year and a half. And by the time it was discovered, it was stage four and metastasized. So I am passionate about wellness and prevention. And when Gordon Gee, our fantastic university president, was recruiting me from Arizona to the Ohio State University, my husband kept saying, why would we want to leave sunny Arizona <laughs> and go to Columbus, Ohio? And I said, because Gordon is giving me the opportunity to pioneer a phenomenal position as chief wellness officer. And really, our vision at Ohio State is to create the healthiest university, not only in the nation, but in the globe. Now, that's a big task. That's a really big dream. Um, and speaking of persistence, because all of you spoke of persistence, I am going to face what I know are a lot of what I call character builders along <laughs> the journey, but we are going to do this because we are very committed and we have a top leadership team now at the university who is very vested in providing the resources that we need to be successful with what we are doing. We have about 65,000 students at, at Ohio State, 45,000 faculty and staff. And most universities, if you look at how they approach wellness, they do it through benefits for faculty and staff and incentives in that way. And student life usually handles wellness for the students. What we are doing at Ohio State is so uniquely different because we are taking a comprehensive, integrative approach to health and wellness. We use the socio-ecological framework as our guiding framework and a life course perspective. And in this framework, the individual, whether they're a student, faculty or staff, the individual is then immediately surrounded by their family and social networks who are very important, then surrounded by our workplace, what we call ecosystem at Ohio State. That's our environment as well as our culture. And we have got to make it easy and fun for people to engage in health and wellness activities. We want to be evidence-based, certainly, but we also have to be innovative where we don't have good evidence to really create the future. I have a button on today because there's more evidence in the literature that says visual triggers can help people with behavior change. So my button says, because we've always done it that way, with a slash through it. <laughs> because academia, in particular, often bound in tradition. That's the way we've always done it here. So we're really breaking out of that mold at Ohio State with what we are doing with health and wellness. And then the last circle deals with the broader community, the state policies at the state and the national level. And if you see each one of those circles are being targeted at Ohio State University with very innovative and evidence-based interventions. So what we did, just very quickly, in creating our structure, our framework for health and wellness, we created what's called a One University Health and Wellness Council that involves the top leaders who have anything to do with health and wellness across the university. 
So it's important these top leaders are in the same boat together with the same vision and working together to integrate. Ohio State was doing a lot of great things for health and wellness, but a lot in silos. But now because we're bringing together the top folks, the VP for HR, the VP for student life, the VP for our health plan. We're all working together to create this common vision. But at the same time, as you could see from this slide, we have created grassroots committees of faculty, staff, and students because the leaders have to work together with the grassroots people to really move us forward. I am so excited about the gold standard and happy to share with all of you that we are in the process right now of our application. And what we needed to do was go tobacco free. That has been endorsed now by our senior management council and our tobacco free policy is going forward to our board of trustees in April with a plan to be launched, implemented this August. So we're really, we're really excited about that. And you can't imagine the character builders that we <laughs> have had to go through, but the hundreds of focus groups that we did throughout our entire organization because we are so large and so complex. It was a character building process, but we got it done. I wanted you to see how what we're doing at Ohio State is really targeted at the gold standard five pillars. So we're going forward with tobacco free, nutrition, we are doing multiple initiatives around nutrition. We have healthy cooking classes, we have nutritional challenges. Everybody has access to a nutritionist for three nutrition visits that we do complementary within our health plan. We are really emphasizing physical activity all throughout our organization. I started something at the university called standing meetings and walking meetings. So I tell everybody, the evidence shows the longer we sit, the more is our risk for cardiovascular disease. So if you want to decrease people's risks, again, Think about out of the box. Standing meetings are common now at the university. And I always say, if you don't do it to decrease cardiovascular risk, do it because you get through meetings a lot faster <laughs> because you stand up. Uh, we have walking meetings. This spring, we're launching a new physical activity challenge across the university called spring training. <clears throat> that'll then lunch hit the road with the Buckeyes this particular <laughs> fall. Uh, I have walking treadmills going in across the university. So people actually are answering emails by walking at the same time, which is great. We are really committed to prevention, screening, and early detection. As you can see, some of our initiatives there and also clinical trials. We have about a thousand clinical trials going on at Ohio State. And we have a website now that people can access to see what's going on with clinical trials and a service that can match them to clinical trials that are going on. Lastly, I just want to show you the Pelotonia at, in Columbus, this is one of our community outreach initiatives. In four years, we have raised $42 million solely for cancer research. So every single penny that is raised as a result of Pel Pelotonio goes right to cancer research. 
And I wanted to show you the one slide of a gentleman from last year, suffered from cancer, had his leg amputated, and he was out there riding the Pelotonia. You have a choice, 25 miles, 50 miles, or 100 miles. So those people who are really competitive go for the 100 mile marker. I did the 25 mile last year. I'm trying to convince my team to go for 50 miles this particular year. The last thing I'm gonna say, and then we can uh, open it up for more discussion. So I said to Gordon Gee, our president this fall, who really walks the talk in terms of wellness. I said, Gordon, we can improve population health at a faster rate if we launch a national summit of universities across the United States and then launch a national consortium of academic institutions who will, will work on wellness and prevention together. So in October, Gordon and I sent a letter out to 250 university presidents, inviting them to join us as we improve population health through academic institutions. I will tell you corporations are far ahead of universities in the whole wellness initiatives. So I'm happy to say we are launching this April 22nd and 23rd. Right now we have over 60 universities throughout the country who are sending people to participate and I'm hoping we hit 100 by April 22nd and 23rd. So I always say, <laughs> skeptics say that'll happen when pigs fly, Buckeye say, and you obviously say, pigs can't fly. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. It's fantastic. So, I mean, Byrne started out with talking about her big dream, and I don't know about you guys, my money's on you. I think you're going to do it, so that's great. And Marty, I'm thinking next year it's going to be a standing panel. Of a standing there you panel. go. Yeah. So fantastic, and we love your enthusiasm and your commitment. Maybe time for one question. I, I think we're a little bit short on time, but you know, certainly as chief wellness officer, and you referenced Gordon and, and your council, uh, clearly commitment from the top at, at OSU. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of senior, you know, of, of commitment from the very top of the organization to make this happen? It's huge. I mean, it's so critical, but we can't forget about the grassroots people either, because things that are dictated from above usually don't sustain. And that's why we're working this at two levels, from the top, but also from the bottom up. We're launching a program called the Leaders Wellness Program at Ohio State next year, where we will put, we're hoping, 100 to 150 leaders through a wellness program that we have created. Because again, if they themselves aren't walking the talk, by role modeling, what's the chance that people in their units are going to also walk that talk? Yep. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking at the clock. Is there time for a, a question? Or... Oh, we have time. Great. Okay. Great. So, so let's uh, let's open it up for from questions. Marty, do you have a question? Thank you very much. Just a, a comment uh, uh, that when I uh, had the good fortune of going to Ohio State, I should say the Ohio State <laughs> University. Uh, uh, to meet with uh, with Gordon Gee, uh, the president, uh, that was brought about by Dr. Richard Goldberg. You were, many of you know Rich uh, when he was at, U at UNC, and one of you know was him before when he was at the Mayo Clinic. But at UNC, uh, Rich was very instrumental in bringing uh, UNC a gold standard as a course under the leadership of Shelley Earp, the director uh, of the Comprehensive Cancer Center. One of the very first things he did when he uh, uh, went to Columbus was to commit to bringing OSU's medical division, the whole enterprise of the medical school and hospitals, gold standard, which under great co-leadership, uh, but under Rich's inspiration, took place. When I met then with Gordon Gee, and he said, we are committed to becoming gold standard, the largest university in the country, I said, and then what? And he said, what do you have in mind? I said, extending a challenge to Michigan. 
<laughs> he has taken that up with alacrity, let me assure you. Now, I don't know whether it's going to be at the game or not, but there is going to be a challenge not only issued to Michigan, um, but to all the Big Ten and throughout. Again, I know at your conference, Bern, um, in, in April to all the universities, and that's how dendritically it's going to take place. So uh, I, I salute you, Bern, and, and please return home to The Ohio State University, where two of the Murphy sons are Buckeyes, oh. Buckeye graduates, <laughs> and uh, tell Gordon that uh, we're so proud of him as well. I will do that. So questions or observations for, yes. I'm wondering why this kind of thing can't be done at a governmental level, at either the state or the national level, ultimately. Uh, Bruce, maybe, Mr. Chairman, would you want to call him Bob Wise? I was just going to say, yeah, we have a governor who has done this at a government level, so perhaps, uh, Governor, could you give a little bit of what you've experienced? Hold it down, Bob. Button. Oh, yeah, thank I'll you. It took, it took the private sector to uh, make sure this button was <laughs> there, there is a difference, and I appreciate, uh, is, I was thinking about the gold standard. There is a difference, and in in, in you, I'm not trying to be humorous when I say this. The difference is that your public employees don't vote for you. Mm. And so that when you go out as a public official, and you're pushing a lot, a significant uh, number of agenda items of which the gold standard is one. And the gold standard, as, as and I was appreciated what Chris was saying last night about the difficulties in Paris, for instance, try the Gilmer County Highway Garage, which is 200 <laughs> miles from the state capital in a rural county that is, uh, uh, has 7,000 people in it. And, and the snow starts flying, and they're alone for... Uh, weeks at a time, literally. And so there, that can be the challenge. It can be done. Uh, Governor Winner of uh, uh, Delaware, when she was in, uh, had, she did something, quite frankly, I didn't have the guts to do, which was she took smoking out of the prisons uh, and out of the uh, casinos. And so it can be done, uh, but it, 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 there are some different dynamics at play. But yes, it can be done. In terms of, I, I think that what Byrne has done, and I just do want to say, um, uh, Marty and Bob and Chris, I do just want to point out, not only Byrne is a, went to West Virginia University, Gordon Gee started his career at West Virginia <laughs> University. So, but uh, we're all mountaineers. And once you've drunk from the headwaters of a West Virginia he a stream. Uh, but, but, I do think it's but I do think it's important, A, the role model aspect of it, uh, that's universal wherever you are. And also, at times, you may have to move incrementally, but you move. And over time, you begin to gain, uh, you begin to gain the traction you need. May I, may I comment to that, um, uh, Bob, that uh, two governors currently are working very hard also on the gold standard uh, in, uh, in Oklahoma, uh, Mary Fallon, a, a Republican, uh, through an executive order, uh, eliminated all smoking on all, uh, uh, all state property, including all state vehicles. That was an executive order. That showed gumption. She's quite a lady. And uh, a, a good friend of hers on the other side of the aisle, a uh, Democratic uh, governor from Colorado, uh, John Hickenlooper. And our, our image is mentally watching this Republican and this Democrat hold hands as they step across and receive the gold standard of Bruce. And I think that that's, it's going to happen. Lastly, and this is putting, uh, never puts the governor on the spot. Unfortunately, I know that uh, Governor Hunt had to leave. But uh, this morning, Governor Hunt has offered to write a letter to a good friend of his, uh, a person by the name of Kathleen Sebelius. Because as we have here, um, Marcus, who is important, essential, in fact, in getting the gold standard accredited at CDC, why not the goose, if that's the gander? Why not HHS? Yeah. And in order to do that, we're going to have to move a lot, Bruce. You're right. And Governor Hunt is going to uh, offer to take on the challenge. And uh, he's been known by Bob Ingram as the Energizer Bunny. He will not let this down. He will not let it go. And we have, we have, in fact, Bruce, a commitment to actually enabling HHS to go gold standard. former government employee that, you know, everybody that works for the government accepts the, the smoking issue. 
about smoking in the workplace. But th this is much more comprehensive, yeah. and yeah. it actually addresses some of the issues that are so important for both heart disease and, and cancer, yep. and that is exercise and diet yep. and lifestyle changes. And nobody is saying that you're going you're gonna to be thrown in jail for eating a, a, a ham sandwich or something. But, right. but to, to make it a public, make a public statement about this and put energy behind it is very important, I think, to set the example. And, and I think it could be done. It's not coercive. It's really educational right. and informative in offering people the opportunity to, 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 to take part in this. Uh, so I, I just don't see why we don't do it on a larger scale. You were more than a quarter of a century a leader of the National Cancer Institute, Bruce, and I know you were pleased and proud to, to see the day when the NCI, <coughs> under John Niederhuber, that's then director, became gold standard accredited, and now it is dendritically or actually virally um, uh, going to the entire NIH campus. So uh, we, we have every reason to hope, and I know that you're working on Mass General. Are you committed, Bruce? To, Bruce, say yes. Do I hear a yes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> They'll be here next year. Good. Good. I, I would like to, to really point out that the political component and the governmental component of these strategies is, is key, and that the United Nations passed a resolution September 2011, approved unanimously by 194 countries, the NCDs resolution that f follows practically all uh, these objectives are in practically included. So now the governments the, of uh, all uh, over the world, they have a mandate and a responsibility to to follow this uh, thing. So I think that it's important to put pressure over the governments, not only to the private uh, sector or the academic. The society as a whole must follow this uh, strategy. I'm just curious as to how benefits and health benefits uh, feed into these healthy behaviors. You know, we will pay people to go and get bariatric surgery, but we won't pay for them to be able to get healthy food. And, and I'm curious what percentage, I'm sure the, that, the, that the benefits have some impact, but is there any way to quantify how changing from um, pain for sickness versus uh, prevention through an HSA or FSA or something like that, what, how that affects uh, healthy behaviors. I'm happy to speak a little bit to that. At Ohio State, people are incentivized, for instance, to take a personal health assessment and to do other types of healthy behaviors and we are costing that out. I mean, we're very outcomes driven right now with the strategies that we are embarking upon. We've got a lot of systematic reviews and meta-analysis coming out that show for every dollar invested in prevention, there's about a four to five dollar return on investment. But I still think we have ways to go in terms of really costing out specific strategies and how it does impact outcomes. I'd like to make to call on Fick. I think, you know, obviously J and J has invested a lot in doing these kinds of assessments and metrics. So Fick, you might have some commentary on that. Sure. Um, certainly the issue of incentive is a very uh, hot issue right now everywhere. Um, I, you heard, I heard already, you know, the penalties that applies or the premium uh, charges that could be added on. So I think uh, the, our belief is incentives, if used appropriately, can drive participation and engagement to get into a program. So within Johnson & Johnson, we had a, uh, a benefit linkage of $500 upfront discount to medical premium or medical contribution premium since 1995. Still today, the same. Um, and that raised participation in our risk assessment as well as um, um, you know, enrolling people into risk modifying modifiable programs that offer to them at no cost. Uh, raised really participation from like 30 percent to about 80 to 85 percent for our U.S. population. The value and the, as mentioned outcomes are critical and we see the value in 
bending the curve, uh, you know, reversing some of the trends, whether it's on obesity, physical activity, uh, cholesterol, tobacco use, all of those have been really reduced over the past 10, 15 years. Certainly a great uh, 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 cost reduction into the rise, the, the growing rise in healthcare costs for Johnson & Johnson, uh, where we see um, our rate of growth in medical as well as pharmaceutical it was has been around 1% over the last four or five years, while our benchmark is going up by about 5%. So there is value uh, of prevention by all means. Um, the, the key learning for us is, you know, people to sustain um, lifestyle, uh, you know, changes, it has to come from within, and it has to be really, they have to know the purpose and the, you know, what exactly their mission in life, what do they want to accomplish, uh, why they don't want to be healthy. If you don't have that, then it's very difficult to sustain those changes. So that's kind of one of our learnings. Thank you. The other thing I'd like to add to that is people need menus of options for the incentives. We give $30 a month back for everybody that completes the PHA. Next okay. year, we're going to offer a menu of options so people could get $30 a month back or membership to our recreational facility exercise room, different options, because not the same thing appeals to everybody. And Alex, and, Ernie, Ernie, then Alex. I was just saying, and similarly, um, we offer the, the physical activity, the uh, fitness center free of charge to all employees. Um, we're wondering what the return on investment is at this point, and so we're, like you, doing a, a personalized risk assessment. We're paying individuals, giving them the opportunity to receive $25 if they'll fill it out so that we can gather data in 2013 to compare it to our first uh, personalized risk assessment, which was done in 2008. So we will be able to show a five-year trend in changed behaviors in response to these various initiatives that we've taken on, but we don't have the data now to be able to uh, know the impact we're having. But we, we certainly anticipate we are having an impact. There's no question about it. The culture has shifted very clearly. Thank you. Alex, I think. Thank you. you have to hold it down. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Judy. And as a uh, somebody from the state of Michigan who has Mary Sue Coleman on their board, I'm going to have to make sure she kicks up her game a little bit <laughs> <laughs> to uh, keep up with this red tide. Uh, but I, I really commend both of you for the programs, both at MD as well as the Ohio State. But uh, you know, I, having been at J and J for a while, I think Fick took you through a lot of the important points. But I think there's a there's one other aspect that I think is really important in this that somehow we need to keep as part of the equ equation. And certainly the focus on costs, but it's what's the impact on things like wellness? What's the impact on productivity? Where can we go from shifting the conversation about healthcare only being a cost driver to being good for society, being an investment, worker productivity, presenteeism, uh, worker satisfaction? Uh, and I think having that as part of the entire equation can have a very significant impact on the way this is framed and uh, you know, ultimately accepted by society. Absolutely, agree. Yeah. Yes, sir. So uh, I, I applaud the activities, not only at the university, but also in, in the community. And uh, I, I think you made an excellent point about how difficult it is to get people to change uh, existing habits. Uh, but there's one population in the U.S. that where we can make an impact on habits before they formed, and that's in the pediatric population. So I have uh, two questions. One is uh, how many activities are really geared towards changing uh, the habits of, of, of our children because that will impact on wellness in the future, both at the level of the parent where they, though they may not take care of themselves, they'll always be interested in the health of their child, number one. And number two, working through school systems or other mechanisms to get children to uh, uh, start having healthy habits that will then carry on through life. I'm so glad you brought that up because I'm both a pediatric nurse practitioner and a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner very invested in child and adolescent health. Um, we are going to start offering a program next year for parents of children, first graders through high school. We have a cognitive behavioral skills building intervention geared on healthy lifestyles. 
One of the things I think we've missed in the whole overweight obesity epidemic that we have is the mental health component, the cognitive behavior skills building component. So the programs we're going to offer our employees who are parents are evidence-based programs that they actually will do and engage their children with. Because I really believe children and adolescents can act of, as agents of change for their families, just like parents can act as the agents of change. So we are very geared to a lifespan approach to health and wellness at our university. And I'll follow up briefly. Um, at Anderson, the control effort that I, that I spoke of that Ron's reinvigorated has eight work groups. We have developed an acronym that we call PEST, the feed of the institution into the community, uh, where we, we focus on policy initiatives, education oriented either toward our peers or the general public, and then third, services, but outside the walls of the clinic, clinical context of MD Anderson. A very big focus this next year is going to be on children for, that very, for, for the very reasons that you raised. Um, right now, um, the, it's, the Texas is a bit unusual uh, to my mind. We, our le state legislature meets every other year. And so although we had just launched this initiative, we saw an opportunity this year to try to take immediate action. And so we have uh, brought our government, and it was interesting, your strategy about bringing together government relations as well as the, the uh, health policy folks as well as the um, um, educational folks on your campus and integrating them is exactly what the model that we're following as well. So we have two um, legislative initiatives in particular. We as a state institution are barred from lobbying our, our representatives at the state level, but we can educate them and we're, we're, we have active undertakings right now to raise the age limit on tanning bed use, that's the initiative number eight, uh, and another around uh, tobacco-free workplaces, which we still don't have as a state. We have many individual communities, some 32 individual communities with legislation for their jurisdictions, but we don't have a state initiative, so that's another thing that we've taken on. Finally, we've partnered, we're, we're in the middle of establishing a partnership with Rice. Rice is a, a very prominent educational institution in the Houston area. They develop a curriculum that reaches some three, four million individuals, uh, children K through 12, uh, with a science-based education curriculum. They've, they've partnered, we're in the process of partnering with MD Anderson to bring health stories into the science-based education platform that they're developing. And we hope to use that as a vehicle to message to children, again, essentially to educate them as a first step, but ultimately you need to change the culture around them as well. Yeah. Marty, how are we doing on time? Uh, Judy, I was just going to ask us to actually, if we may need to move into the global, because we have a few moments there, and then we have to break for a very important photograph. I mean, clearly lots of interest, and maybe during our networking break, those of you who didn't get a chance to ask questions can interact, and I guess no time to hear from the ACC, huh? <laughs> so, um, obviously, I think that it's no exaggeration to say that what you've heard today from Vernon and Ernie is really the gold standard at its best. And whether you're talking about change in your communities or in your workplace, it's, it's really all about leadership. So we, we greatly thank you for your leadership and your commitment and, and for the time you've taken to be with us today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So quickly, for our grand finale, we are going to, as promised, talk about the global gold standard. And just a quick re reminder, we had a team of people, really dedicated uh, people under the leadership of FIC from J&J, &J, but you see here that we had individuals from J&J, &J, Novartis, Sanofi, AstraZeneca, and Quintiles, both here in the U.S. and also globally. And this was the team of folks who brought forward the proposal uh, for global accreditation, and it was approved by our executive committee last year. And this team then helped uh, move forward with implementation. Just a quick reminder, it was really tricky for our team. We wanted to maintain the integrity of the gold standard as we know it, but we also know that some of the requirements in the U.S. don't necessarily translate in other countries because of their, their health systems and their, their, their legal situations. So what we have done is define the global gold standard, and you see it here. First and foremost, you must be gold standard accredited in the United States. So you must be a U.S. gold standard accredited company. You must be tobacco-free worldwide. 
And then for the remaining pillars, we came up with a series of essay questions that would allow for some cultural or different regional specificity, but being really true to the pillar. And so we came up with a series of essay questions around tobacco use, nutrition, activity, prevention, screening, et cetera. And with that completed, we have instituted the application process. We did that earlier this year. And I'm really pleased and excited to say that we currently have two of our companies in the process of applying, J&J &J and Novartis. And we also have a number of other companies who have expressed interest. So this is really happening, and it's happening now. And I'd like to just maybe call on Alex of J&J to talk a little bit about your commitment to going global with the gold. Well, thanks, Judy. And uh, look, before I comment, I just want to thank you for your commitment. You know, Marty and Chris, I think we've all been incredibly lucky to uh, work around Judy. And uh, you don't find anybody who brings so much energy. And uh, if you want to be able to go the distance, be careful about putting on your running shoes with her. Because uh, she can definitely go the distance. But look, we're, uh, the way I'd say is we're, we're pleased about a lot of the work that we've done at J&J, &J, but far from satisfied. And I think two of the themes that we really touched on today is this issue of global and, uh, and how do we weave wellness and prevention into it have been critical to our efforts. And when you look around the people in this room, I think many of us represent global organizations. And uh, the ability to take this out, make it a much broader platform, uh, recognizing all the unique differences. Uh, but uh, in the end, I, I think it's something that we really need to do. And, uh, and taking a lot of the same uh, themes and programs and approaches that we just talked about in the last session and applying it in this context uh, globally, I think is also critically important uh, to us to be successful over the long term. So That's thank you. Terrific, thank you. And we have Tom Held from Novartis, maybe Tom. Oh, I'm so, certainly. My quick comment, it was actually uh, when, um, when J and J first became gold standard accredited in FIC and uh, Delu uh, Ephraim Delugash, you two guys were absolutely essential to that. Um, after you became gold standard accredited, it was at, at that time that Bill Weldon said to Ephraim and to Fick, well, wait a minute, we're a multinational co company. What are we doing? And it was at that point in time, over 18 month period, you went smoke free worldwide, and, and globally, and how, that was years ago, Alex. So you already took that huge first step and made that first pillar of tobacco cessation a permanent fixture within J&J's global world. Yep. And we'll be certainly reaching out to understand. We know that it was a significant hurdle. So as other member companies want to do this, we'll be, we'll be tapping you and FIC to understand some of those best practices. So thank you. So Tom, maybe a word about the Novartis application and commitment? Sure, I rode the, uh, I shared a cab with Vic coming from the airport yesterday and one of the things we spoke about was kind of coming across the finish line together. So Great. I know as uh, leaders in our organizations, we're all intensely competitive, but I think we kind of temporarily agreed to try to come over the finish line <laughs> together. <laughs> a photo finish, a photo finish. Right, and you know, and I would like to echo a couple things that Alex said about this as well. And um, the other thing that I think that, that a lot of this comes under is the veil of inclusiveness in our organizations. And when we yeah. talk about diversity and inclusion in particular, um, we talk about the business case for it. So I'm thinking about the gold standard and, and how it can make us, or in each of our respective organizations, more competitive, yeah. attracting the greatest talent, to, again, to go back to, to, to Marty's point, to, to, uh, to fight the common foe of cancer. So we're inspired to, uh, to join everybody on this journey uh, for the global standard. Terrific, we thank you for that. So Chris, any commentary? Yeah, um, you know, I think we, the, the panel, uh, first of all, was, was excellent in, in drawing out a number of themes just that are terrific. behind this. This is, this is you know, uh, this isn't just a tactical approach, um, uh, that there are a lot of issues that are raised. Um, uh, one of the things that has surprised me in, in talking to a number of health experts, um, and, and as a non-smoker who now can pretty much move around the world in a smoke-free environment, I was surprised to actually learn that the, the single biggest health risk that still exists, even in the United States, is smoking um, and tobacco addiction. So we haven't actually um, broken that yet, and, and so we have to, to continue to commit to that, and I think that's why in that gold standard, um, that, that you have to be tobacco-free um, worldwide is, is, is so important. Um, another message came out was this necessity for transversality, <clears throat> that it's not just one department that does it. This, this, mm -hmm. and, and I think, uh, Tom, your point about inclusiveness is, is, uh, is extremely important. I, I can tell you from my own experience of um, you know, 
trying to encourage use of stairs um, in the company, uh, I was immediately confronted by the health and safety people um, who were suddenly saying, well, you know, we, we, we could have a higher risk of, of work-related accidents um, uh, the people are using the stairs. So I, I was able to, to actually uh, uh, impose the will of being CEO to say, well, we'll we, we can, you know, the risk of, of, of people having heart attacks and everything else is, is more than stumbling on the stairs. Uh, but I did find uh, one day when I walked into our Paris headquarters, which is this lovely um, old house minion building that there are now little signs everywhere um, saying, please hold on to the stair rail when you use the <laughs> stairs. Uh, <clears throat> so, you, you know, you still have various, because the, the thing is that people are rewarded on different things in right. the company. And, and the people who are worried about health and safety, for example, may not be the ones who are going to be your biggest champions on, on activity in, in the company. And I just use it as an anecdote to say that there's this need to have a, a you know, a company-wide um, approach, um, especially since benefits and health and benefits tends to be in one particular area and, and, and a bit of an arcane subject for most of the people in, in, in companies. So, so I, I think that was an extremely important point. But I think the most important thing that I, that I heard today, and, and I think it's certainly uh, exemplified in companies like J&J, uh, &J, but what we're, we're seeing generally, and it, it, it's, it's what Ernie referred to as a culture of health and what Byrne talked about as a culture of wellness. This, this becomes a cultural, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and that's something that we have to do as a society. Now, how, how do we make it happen in society? You can either wait for some big master plan to come, on, come along, or we have to, um, as leaders of individual organizations, start to make it happen and create a groundswell, and I think that's what, what we're seeing. Um, but it is, it is true that if, you know, when you heard um, Byrne talk about what it takes to get behavior modification, you know, unless we start to um, bring wellness in as part of our way of life, we're not going to succeed. And we can do incentives and we can do penalties, and those are important. We can do programs. But you know, uh, I think what you heard from MD Anderson and, and from o Ohio State and from J&J &J and Novartis and you know, actually through Judy's leadership, I think one of the benefits that we as Sanofi are getting through Judy's leadership of the, of the task force is this continued exposure to what it really takes to create this culture of wellness. And, and so, Judy, I'd like to, to express also my pride in, in the fact that you're, you're, you're carrying this on because I think this is starting to have an impact on the culture of our organization. And I think if you get to that cultural level, you're really getting to a different level. And, and I think at that point, you can really um, ma make a difference. And I think, as I say, the panel and the experience of, of J&J and Novartis really brought those aspects out extremely well. So um, thank you to the panel. Thank you to you, Judy, for having uh, chaired that so, so ably. Um, and thank, to, thank you to, uh, to all of you who are supporting the gold standard because, as I said, this gold standard, I think, is not just those five simple steps. You are completely changing how people think about themselves, how they're thinking about um, uh, uh, their health, and I think can have a, a big impact on the communities and the societies in, in which we live. So with that, I think we'll take a, a break. We have the all-important photograph out there in the lobby, and we'll start back at about uh, uh, quarter to 11. Thank you very much. Before you. before you leave, uh, those of you who are going to be either seated on the, uh, on the benches or on the immediately behind, you've all received this where you're supposed to sit or stand. Uh, if you've not received this, please file in in any way. Uh, and Eric will help place you behind them. Please, if you would, go directly to outside and to your right at the far end because we want to have the picture taken and Peggy is going to help us do so with, with Therese in a matter of minutes. So, Peggy, are you ready? Follow Peggy. And a round of applause for Judy and the panel.